Gravitational waves are the last prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity, and they seem almost impossible to detect. But have we finally done it? What is it about Einstein? Why is he the most famous and best loved smart person ever? It has a lot to do with his revolutionary theory of general relativity, in which he showed us that the force of gravity is an illusion. Instead, mass warps the fabric of 4D space-time, leading to what we see as gravitational motion. Check out this playlist for more details. Now it turns out that general relativity makes predictions far beyond the familiar gravity. There's the deflection of light that we see as gravitational lensing. There's the slowing of time in gravitational fields. There's the dragging of space-time by spinning masses. Einstein is amazing because every one of these predictions from his beautiful work have been physically tested and verified. We love Einstein because he's been proven right so many times. However, there's one last incredible prediction that has never been directly observed. Gravitational waves. The idea of gravity not as a force but as warped space-time is often depicted in analogy as a flexible rubber sheet being depressed by a heavy ball. Now this isn't entirely apt, however the analogy can give us a sense of what a gravitational wave really is. Drop a ball onto a rubber sheet and a dip forms, which then causes other objects to move differently along the sheet, analogous to gravity. Move the ball around and I create a series of ripples that flow outwards on the sheet, similar to the ripples on a pond. Same deal with gravitational waves. Accelerate a mass through space in the right way and you produce gravitational ripples, an outflowing fluctuation of expanding and contracting space-time. So what sort of movement produces G-waves? Here's a technical term. You need to change the quadrupole moment of a mass distribution. That just means any change that isn't spherically or cylindrically symmetric. So a rotating sphere or a cylinder doesn't make waves. But two objects orbiting each other, or an asymmetrically spinning or exploding thing does. Now just as the ripples in a rubber sheet propagate at a certain speed, determined by the stiffness of the rubber, gravitational waves, and indeed gravity itself, propagates according to the stiffness of space-time. In other words, at the speed of light. Check out this episode for more info. This speed limit comes from the fact that the speed of light is built into Einstein's field equation, which is necessary for it to be invariant to the Lorentz transformation. It's worth pointing out that this speed limit is really the speed of causality, the speed at which space-time talks to itself. And all massless things, including G-waves and light, must travel at that speed. So what on earth do G-waves even look like? Unlike ripples on a pond, or even electromagnetic waves, which are all simple up-down longitudinal waves, gravitational waves are what we call quadrupole waves. They propagate as a fluctuation of squeezed and stretched space, in a sort of cross-like pattern. If one passed through your body, you'd become taller and thinner, then shorter and fatter, then taller and thinner, etc. until it passed by. How much would you be stretched? Well, let's first think about all the sorts of things that might produce detectable gravitational waves. The most insane gravitational phenomena in the universe, neutron stars or black holes inspiraling just before merger, or gravitational catastrophes like supernova explosions or collisions between giant black holes. These make G waves that lengthen or contract our space here on Earth by a factor of 10 to the power of minus 21 or less. That changes your height by less than a millionth of the width of a proton. And this changes for the most powerful waves that have likely ever passed through you. Now this power depends on how far away our catastrophic gravitational event is. But these things are going to be far, because they're incredibly rare. They happen in any given galaxy once every several thousand years. Any G wave that we're likely to spot is going to come from a distant galaxy, hundreds of millions of light years away. Spotting these is a very difficult experiment, and so it's no wonder that gravitational waves remain the only major prediction of GR without a direct measurement. Now, I should mention that a Nobel Prize has already gone out in 1993 for indirect detection. Gravitational waves carry energy, and so when, say, two massive objects orbit each other close enough to produce a lot of this gravitational radiation, their orbits will lose energy and decay, causing them to spiral in towards each other. This has been seen in binary neutron stars, and the results agreed exactly with the rate of gravitational radiation predicted by general relativity. But if we could actually see G waves, we'd be able to study black holes, neutron stars, even the extremely early universe in ways never before possible. It would be a monumental scientific discovery. But how do you detect a 100 billion billionth of a difference in length? 
with lasers, of course. In fact, with a giant Michelson interferometer. This is the LIGO experiment, and it goes something like this. Shoot a laser beam, split it in two, and then send the twin beams at right angles down four kilometer long vacuum tubes. Bounce them off mirrors back and forth 400 times before bringing the beams back together. Now, if we get the length of those paths just right, we can make the peaks of one of those electromagnetic waves line up with the valleys of the other, causing them to completely cancel out. Destructive interference. No signal is seen, but if a gravitational wave passes by, it'll shrink one of those paths and lengthen the other, and then vice versa, oscillating with time. The returning beam won't cancel out perfectly, and you'll get these little blips of signal. Now the original LIGO was able to spot changes in the length of its 4 kilometer arms of around 1 1 thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Nice. Except for the fact that anything can cause such tiny changes in path lengths. Extremely weak seismic activity, a car driving miles away, a bird farting nearby. Even quantum fluctuations in the photon rate causes noise. So, how do we tell that it's a gravitational wave? Well, a G wave leaves a very distinct signature first contracting one arm while stretching the other, and then oscillating over time. It's even possible to get a direction for the wave by measuring the relative path lengths. But to be extra sure, you want to get the detection in multiple sites. And there are two LIGO sites, one in Washington and one in Louisiana, plus a collaborator facility Virgo in Italy. So, how many G waves did LIGO find? Well, between 2002 and 2010 when it ran, it found zero no gravitational waves at all. Now this isn't necessarily so surprising. LIGO really just scratched the minimum sensitivity needed to spot merging neutron stars and black holes in relatively nearby galaxies. Now based on astrophysical estimates of the number of these events, it was calculated that every year you should get somewhere between one and one ten thousandth of one event. So, best case scenario, we see eight events total. Worst case, we have to wait 10,000 years to see one. I guess it was somewhere in between, which still turned out to be zero. After seeing nothing for a long time, LIGO shut down so it could level up into advanced LIGO. Some pretty insane engineering upgrades make it 10 times more sensitive, which actually means it sees a thousand times more volume of the universe. Much more chance of spotting crazy gravitational phenomena. Given that, we might be expected to see many events per year. So where are they? See, even though Advanced LIGO only started running a few weeks ago on September 18th, some predictions tell us that we should have seen something already. Are they holding out on us? Does this mean that G-waves aren't even real? Well, it's important to keep in mind that the LIGO team is extremely cautious. Even if they spotted a wave, they'd keep it super secret until they'd quadruple checked results, which could take months they wouldn't announce until at least the end of the year. They are so cautious that the team deliberately injects false signals into the system to check the verification process and make 100% sure that the first actual G-Wave detection is the real thing. In fact, only three team members know whether a given signal is real or fake. So every time this has happened in the past, the team has been told at the very end, Sorry, just a drill. Now, even the fake signals are meant to be secret, but hundreds of scientists work on LIGO. Wouldn't you expect someone to say something to a boyfriend, their mother, the postman, Twitter? Maybe. A rumor emerged in late September about a detection. It made some Twitter noise and nature picked it up. Links in the description. A little birdie told me that it's the signal of two black holes in spiraling towards each other. But is it just a drill? Maybe. Except, another rumor is the signal was actually in the engineering data taken before the official turn on date. Still a fake? Now LIGO is being definitely quiet on this and will remain so until the end of the year. But if this is real, then Einstein's last great prediction will have been directly verified. And even if not, the new advanced LIGO still has a real shot at this. If we hear any more, we'll definitely tell you on a future episode of Space Time. Last week we talked about real spaceship options for getting to the nearest star. 
You guys had lots of great questions. Eshin Dan asks, how do we avoid hitting meteors and other space stuff at such high speed? Large bodies like asteroids are rare enough in interstellar space that hitting one is very unlikely. The problem is the small stuff like a tiny dust grain. A 10 milligram grain would strike with the kinetic energy of around 100 kilograms of TNT if our spaceship was moving at 10% the speed of light. Now there are a number of ideas for protecting against this, including magnetic shielding and deploying layers of absorbing or deflecting material ahead of our craft. It's definitely one of the things we want to get right. Nobunaga 1991 and others ask, how can humans survive accelerating to such high speeds? Now actually, you can get to 10% of light speed by accelerating at a comfortable 1G over a little less than five months. Now the trip is gonna take decades, so this is pretty good acceleration. Aaron Knight and others ask, how could we leave the ram scoop out of this episode? So this was a hard decision. The Bussard ramjet is an amazing idea. So the idea is you have this gigantic physical or magnetic funnel ahead of your craft, which scoops up this interstellar hydrogen and channels it into maybe a fusion engine to power your ship, which means you don't have to carry the fuel, you collect it along the way. So it is a great idea, and the name the Lazy 8 is a fantastic one. Let's do it. To Tim Pip, we're getting there. Maybe even next week. To answer Mars Petras's interstellar question, I'm still mad at Cooper. How could he? Denton Crime Scene informs us that he was sorry to see the other dude go, but this dude is also a dude. Thanks, dude. And we're going to leave you with Procyon Beta's bittersweet comment. Born too late to explore the Earth. Born too early to explore the galaxy. Born just in time to watch PBS Space Time. Oh, 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 oh,